Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the June 7th Dare County Board of Commissioners meeting. At this time, I'd like to call forward the Reverend Craig Peel to lead us in an invocation. Reverend Peel, thanks for being here. It's uh, once again uh, it's great different. to be able to do this in person, isn't it? Amen to that. Yes, sir. Thanks for your invitation. Yes, sir. I invite you all to pray with me. Loving God, we thank you for this wonderful time in which the days lengthen, the weather warms, and that virus seems to be loosening its relentless grip on us. We bless you that you have your ear turned to us once again in these important moments for our county. We recognize, dear God, that you've called us to live in a time in which we're bombarded daily by events and words and actions which can easily leave us dismayed and unnerved. <coughs> we're routinely asked to discern the difference between information and disinformation, truth and untruth. And you know that these are difficult days in which to serve in places of leadership. So we ask you to bless our commissioners as they fulfill their call to reassure us and shape the policies and decisions which will work for the good of the children and families of Dare County. Give them thick skins where truth demands it and <coughs> grace-filled pliability where fresh creative thinking is asked of them. Bless them with ears tuned to listen to your still small voice, spirits willing to make difficult choices. May they address complex problems with an eye toward reaching just and environmentally sound solutions. God, we pray that you will walk beside them, give them listening ears as they deal with the Avon and public budget public hearing items on their agenda. And as they move through to the public comments, the consent agenda, and the board appointments, grant them, Lord, the gift of thoughtful reflection and discussion, respect for those with whom they may differ. Give them today and each day your guiding grace so that they may walk by no door which leads to your will. Shower them with your blessings, Lord. Guard and protect them and each county employee laboring for our welfare, whether in public view or in more hidden places of service. These prayers we ask so that your holy name may be honored this place in this day. Amen. 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 May we stand for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one, one nation, nation under God, God indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> Board, I'd like to uh, ask your consideration to move item 14 to 6A, and the reason being um, I'd like to hear from... Um, commissioners and the county manager in case there's anything we need uh, that comes up under that um, item that we need to vote on. The reason being, um, I have to leave here uh, this morning no later than 1130. Um, I have lost a third member of my family who was a Captain Judith Wright in the Vietnam War, served in the mass unit on the front lines. And um, I have to attend her funeral this afternoon, be a military funeral. So uh, God rest her soul. But I ask for your, um, if I could move this item to item 6A. Mr. <coughs> Chairman, I'm so deeply sorry for your loss and I will consider, uh, make a motion to move. Thank you. The motion's uh, to um, move item 14 to 6A by Commissioner House been seconded by Commissioner Tobin. Any further discussion? Hearing none, those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, like sign. Motion carries unanimous. County Manager. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Item one on the agenda is the Chairman's opening remarks. Thank you, County Manager. Um, 
got a number of things I'd like to share with you this morning. First being um, a COA. Um, the board um, on the 25th, we had a top and out ceremony uh, at the uh, COA with uh, Barn Hill Contracting. A very special day. We were all out there to um, have the uh, final beam placed in the roof on, uh, of that facility. And I want to thank my fellow commissioners for being there. It was a really, turned out to be a really nice day. So I think we have a video and some photos I'd like to share with the uh, public right now with respects to that. Barnhill Contracting Company hosted a topping out ceremony on Tuesday, May 25th, 2021. To commemorate the last piece of steel being erected on the College of the Albemarle's new academic building, signifying the structural completion of the project that is currently underway on COA's Dare County campus. The project manager for Barnhill, Clint Hardison, shared some words during the ceremony. This milestone on the project would have not been possible if it was not for the hard work and dedication from this entire team. These individuals have been putting in thousands of hours in what are some of the toughest working conditions many of us have ever experienced. With all that we have faced thus far, these construction workers have pushed through in order to keep the project moving towards excellence. Our project team here at COA has had to overcome multiple unique challenges that few have ever experienced before. It has taken a total team effort to overcome these challenges thus far, and we will continue to do so moving forward. This has been a huge collaboration with Dare County, COA, Boomerang Design, and Bornhill Contractor. To honor all that they did, along with what each and every one of you did to make this build possible, you will be invited to sign your name on this piece of structural steel. Eventually, this section of steel will be covered over, but you will always be part of this building. Your signature will forever commemorate your ties to the College of the Outmall Project and your dedication to Dare County. The last member of steel being set symbolizes not the highest point, but the entrance to a future that the College of the Albemarle's education will provide. There is still ample work to be completed, but thanks to the dedication of everyone involved, construction is scheduled to be finished in early 2022, with classes starting that fall. For more information on COA's new academic building and to follow the facility's progress, visit darenc.com slash projects. <clears throat> That's pretty exciting. I tell you, it doesn't get any better than that. And uh, really, really excited to... Um, see this come to fruition. Speaking of which, um, Barnhill's projecting the current uh, schedule overall, uh, the completion date of January the 30th, 2022. Uh, uh, the project is about 40% complete uh, right now. Um, if any of you have been by there, uh, primarily you'll see the work activities are focused on the exterior they're doing some interior framing now they're pouring some additional concrete <coughs> pads and they're installing uh, hangers for the mechanical equipment so throughout the next 30 days um, they'll be roughing in uh, walls and and start uh, ins insulation and sheathing and doing some air uh, air barriers and and uh, trying to uh, complete all the interior framing and then they'll start on the fire sprinkler rough end. So this is uh, moving along uh, pretty good. Uh, they have had some challenges, as most of you are aware. Any, anybody building anything to date, material, um, there's some material challenges that all of our builders uh, are, are working with. And, you know, hopefully in the next few months, uh, uh, these material challenges, uh, uh, slow shortages will, will uh, pick up throughout the country, but they are experiencing some of that right now. 
but uh, <clears throat> pretty exciting to see the uh, progress at COA. Got some more great news um, with respect to COA. <clears throat> I think last year we had one student from each of our three high schools walk across the stage during uh, graduation and receive <laughs> their um, associate degree the same time that uh, they received their high school degree. Well, I'm excited to report today that this year there are 12 students. Um, at Cape Hatteras Secondary School, um, <laughs> Laura Hooper uh, got an associate's in, in arts. She was magnum cum laude, by the way. Uh, Leah Barkley, uh, once again, associate's in arts, cum laude. Uh, Elizabeth Quidley, cum laude. Associates in Arts. Also, uh, two students out of, out of Cape Hatteras uh, had uh, received college transfer pathway completions, which will take them into a four-year college. That's uh, uh, Emmeline Baker and Maria Bradley. And then a fire protection technology certificate was awarded to Joseph Hodges. From Manio, we had... Um, Five students there, Ricky Sue Bass Knight, Associates in Science, Jeremy Beasley, Associates in Arts, Catherine Daniels, Associates in Science, uh, Jasmine Incasso, I'm, I'm probably not doing her last name justice, I apologize, Associates in uh, Science, and Elizabeth Hodgson, Associates in Science. And then from First Flight High School, Jacob Hutchins, welding so um all of these are pretty pretty exciting uh numbers uh to be able to share with you this morning i have um i have lost my notes but this this next um piece that i'm gonna share with you i remembered uh explicitly um since we have uh, instigated, uh, implemented the uh, DARE Guarantee Scholarship Fund. We have awarded in the first year 101 uh, awards for scholarships out of our DARE, uh, DARE Guarantee Scholarship Fund, total of about $126,000 of that two fifty. dollars So that's exciting. That is really exciting. So the words getting out in the first year um, of this. So, so we'll, uh, we'll continue to, to award those students and, and help those families in need for, for scholarships for our, for our graduating seniors throughout Dare County. Um, and um, pretty, pretty uh, impressive stuff. So if you know of anybody that's graduating, and need some help, then uh, certainly reach out and we'll put them in contact with the uh, proper individual to, to apply for those scholarships. Next item I want to talk about is housing. You probably read uh, on The Voice, um, we, uh, I called a special meeting recently to uh, address the housing issue. Um, We've been dealing with it uh, way too long. It was a little bit of frustration on my part that we have not uh, we've not been able to uh, do something as of this date. But what came out of that special meeting, uh, which we held on June the first, is that our board agreed to ask the UNC School of Government to de develop a, a finance initiative uh, and a conceptual plan for affordable housing uh, at the uh, county-owned Bowsertown property uh, on Roanoke Island and possibly the Elizabethan Inn as well. So um, we're hoping that uh, we'll start to move forward with this and have something concrete with respect to workforce and essential housing. As part of that June 1st uh, consensus, <laughs> the board also asked uh, DFI to develop a plan that features a mix 
of affordable, and I hate using that word. I'd rather use workforce and essential housing uh, for the sites. Uh, Commissioner Ross, I know that was one of your major concerns that we, we look at a mix. Yes, sir. And so, so we've asked them to do that with varying income levels. So, um, so DFI will do that. And uh, we also uh, had some conversation with some additional properties out there that was brought to the board's attention. And DFI is going to uh, explore uh, those possibilities as well. So um, I think we're on the right track now. And hopefully in, um, in the coming months, we'll have something concrete that we can certainly uh, present to the board and, and make some decisions on. Um, next item I have, <clears throat> if you, um, it's that time of year, I got to get up and I, I watch the news in the morning and one of the local stations for the last couple of weeks have been talking about hurricane season. And I said, man, why, why can't you just wait until June one? And, you know, but they're doing their job and uh, it's here. <clears throat> Started June one. And uh, so if you hadn't gotten your priority uh, passed, uh, you need to do so. You can do that and if you go on our darenc.com slash reentry, uh, you can get your uh, reentry pass. Uh, I remind you that there's four categories. Priority one is essential personnel, essential utility personnel, government personnel, medical personnel, and, uh, and our, certainly our damage assessment team out of our planning department. Priority two is permanent residents, essential personnel for critical businesses. Um, and um, then priority three is um, our out-of-state property owners. Um, they're priority three. And then priority four is the general public and our visitors. So if you haven't gotten those, go on our website once again, darenc.com slash reentry. To, uh, to get your uh, re-entry pass. And then um, uh, last but not least, Commissioner Couch, I know you'll be glad when you see this uh, come to fruition, but we're 75% complete on the Jug Handle Bridge as of uh, June the 3rd um, uh, with a projected opening of late this year, 1st of uh, 2022. So uh, the bridge officially... Once it's officially open, uh, work will begin on both removing 2.8 miles of section in, of NC-12 uh, that um, uh, the bridge will bypass. And, um, and so we're looking, looking forward to uh, the opening of this uh, bridge as well. And um, we're looking forward to uh, that later part of this year, first part of next year. As of June the 3rd also, there were 288 <laughs> of 388 uh, concrete gri 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 grinders, they call it, have been set, and 90 out of 108 deck spans have been cast. So that's quite a that's quite a bit. Uh, that's equivalent to, as they said, about 297 out of 352 pylons. So I know the south was moving a lot faster than the north moving south. And the reason being is they had hit some, uh, some really, really uh, hard clay and stuff on the north end, and that's why the south end is moving a lot faster and coming to the north end. So, so that'll be exciting to uh, see that happen. And, um, and with that being said, county manager, uh, that completes uh, my chairman's comments. Chairman, that brings us to item two on the agenda is the presentation of the county service pen. Um, again, we don't have any of the <clears throat> folks here this morning, but we still want to recognize them. And so I think Matt's got a, some pictures. Uh, first on our list is Troy Coltrane. Troy's with the sheriff's office. He's a sheriff's office investigator. He's getting his 15-year pen. He was assigned as a road deputy when he first began with the sheriff's office working in the Manio district. He had an interest in working in investigations for the last several years. Switched over to a criminal investigation unit where he's began to work crime scenes. Troy worked hard and did very well with his assignments. 
He has been sent to many evidence schools where he has become proficient in being able to identify latent prints and comparing them for identification for various crimes. Not only is Troy a big hit with us, but Troy has given a lot of time and talent to coaching baseball in his home county of Terrell. He encourages young men to work hard, to excel in the sport they love. He's been a mentor to many, and we are proud of him for these services outside the sheriff's office as well. Troy is a true asset to our office, and we look forward to several more years of having him around. Uh, thank you, Troy, for your 15 years of service to Dare County. Next is also in the sheriff's department, Lori Fitzgerald. She's receiving her 20-year pin. Lori started her career in the sheriff's office as an office support specialist and was promoted to office manager in 2010. Lori is the office agency coordinator for the State Division of Criminal Information and is responsible for the agency compliance of records. She holds seven specialty state certifications to accomplish the task, and she is tested on six of them every two years to retain the certifications. Lori efficiently handles many tasks and does a great job in keeping the office records accurate. Some of her other tasks include completing the accounts deposit for submission to finance, incident report quality review, and the operational activity reports. We all appreciate Laurie's willingness to help in completing a myriad of tasks and statistical reports. Again, thank you, Laurie, for your 20 years of service to Dare County. Next is Larry Sean Hughes. Most of you know him by Sean. Uh, he's a fleet maintenance superintendent and is receiving his 25 year pin. Sean started at Public Works 25 years ago as a mechanic. His talent for mechanical work was quickly recognized but so was his ability to tackle complex computer problems and diagnose various shop issues. Through the years, he has become the go-to guy for any obstacles the shop faces. Sean moved his way up to supervisor and took on many more responsibilities. Most recently, he has stepped into the role of fleet maintenance superintendent. This has been an easy transition for him since he performed many of those duties for years. Sean's easygoing personality and natural talent make him a great asset to public works. And Sean, thank you for your 25 years of service to Dare County. Chairman, that would then bring us to item three, the employee of the month. And we're going to move employee of the month to the next meeting. There's some conflicts there, and so we'll come back to that next time. Okay. Um, <clears throat> item four, Mr. Chairman, is a public hearing. This is a public hearing on the Avon Beach Nourishment. Uh, as you know, all the letters have sent out, all the publications have been done, and the next step uh, and going forward with this uh, public, with this utility district is to move forward with this public hearing. So we'll conduct this public hearing at this time. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, with regard to this public hearing, it's with regard to the Avon Beach Nourishment Project only. If you're here to speak about the budget or you're here to speak uh, anything in public comment, please wait till we get those items. Uh, you'll have five minutes to say what you want to say. This is not question and answer. This is just an opportunity for you to give your comment to the board. They will not be responding to you uh, during the public comment period. You have five minutes. Uh, there's a green light that will come on when your time begins. There's a yellow light that will come on uh, when you have about a minute left, and there's a red light that comes on when your time is up. For those of you that are in Buxton, we'll be timing as well. You may not be able to see the lights, but we'll let you know. Uh, when your time, when a minute's left, and then we'll let you know when your time is up. Uh, please adhere to these. I don't know how many we have, but we may have a lot of people that want to speak, and so we're going to adhere strictly to the times, and when we get there, we're going to ask you to conclude your remarks. With that said, we would open the public comment or the public hearing. And is there anyone here, and I don't have anyone signed up here, but is anyone here uh, in Manio that wants to speak with regard to Avon Beach Nourishment? Seeing none, we would move down to Buxton. Is there anyone in Buxton that would like to speak? Yes, our first speaker is Mr. Belton Gray. Welcome, Mr. Gray. Uh, thank you very much. Good morning. As you already know, my name is Belton Gray, Jr. I live in the old village of Kenny Keat, and uh, I appreciate this few minutes to uh, address the board concerning the Avon Beach Nourishment Project. Um, I'd first like to thank you all for the uh, effort that you all have put into this. I know it's been very time consuming. It's an ongoing thing living on the Outer Banks as far as the erosion is concerned. Um, that being said, I would like to um, just take a few minutes to uh, look back at some recent history uh, and hope this will help keep our minds straight on the path that we need to take. Um, I've got a couple of articles here I'm going to reference. Uh, they come from the Dare County website and also from uh, State of the Beach. Um, 
Chairman Woodard uh, mentioned the Jug Handle Project, which uh, was very timely concerning what we're discussing here now. Uh, the S-turns have always been a historical uh, part of the island that has been uh, under heavy erosion that we've always had to deal with. Um, from the um, Dare County website, uh, Merlot Beach, the project was completed in September 2014. Beach nourishment was completed by North Carolina Department of Transportation in September 2014 to protect a section of North Carolina 12 locally known as the S-curves or S-turns north of Rodanthe on Hatteras Island. In conjunction with North Carolina DOT, crews with Great Lakes Dredge and Dock Company LLC completed dredging and placed 1.7 million cubic yards of sand on the shoreline in the designated project area. Uh, from State of the Beach, an update on this project and on longer term measures to deal with the erosion on the S-turns that is impacting Highway 12 was provided in the following article, uh, which appeared in newsofobserver.com, July 2014. Um, this was a $20.3 million contract on the heavy, heavily eroded area of Rodanthe. Um, DOT made a, a couple of references, uh, one, to provide a buffer uh, and also buy enough time. Um, later, the article mentioned DOT engineers have a longer term fix in mind, a bridge that will lift more than two miles of Highway 12 high above the surging ocean. They want to buy time and provide a protective buffer for their three-year construction project by building out a 100-yard beach at Rodanthe. The new beach will last a few years if all goes well until ocean storms wash all that sand away. Um, it's also mentioned that the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers has estimated that the cost of pumping sand <laughs> on only 14 miles of beach along the whole Outer Banks to be a $1.6 billion project over 50 years. It says this will be the um, most costly dredge and fill project in the nation's history. Beach nourishment is an ongoing project. We don't have the money to continue throwing at beach nourishment. The last article I'd like to mention uh, also comes from the Dare County website, Hatteras Island, Buxton. This project was completed on February 27th, 2018, just a few short years ago, gentlemen. 2.9 miles of shoreline from the haulover north of Buxton to the oceanfront groin at the Cape Hatteras Lighthouse at a cost of $22.1 million dollars. Weeks Marine pumped out the final load of sand at the northern end of the nourishment project on Tuesday, February 27, 2018. All 2.6 million cubic yards of sand have now been placed along the stretch of beach that runs 2.9 miles from the hall over north of Buxton to the oceanfront groin. That's right, you have Cape about Paris a minute Lighthouse. left. Thank you. I would like to point out that all 2.6 million cubic yards of sand are now gone and the money that was used to spend on it is for naught. So I would like to ask the board to uh, stop and think about the road that we're on concerning this and find us something that's going to show for our money. We'll pay your taxes if you'll give us something to show for it. Pump up Highway 12. Use the, use the sand to raise the highway so that the road will be usable and at least we'll have something to show for our money. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Gray. Anyone else from Buxton like to speak? Yes, one more speaker, Ms. Mary Ann Marcel. Welcome, Ms. Marcel. <laughs> Thank you. Good morning. Um, first, I'd like to say that I do appreciate the opportunity to attend the meeting here in Buxton rather than traveling to Manio, because on uh, Saturday, I traveled 700 miles to come here. That's how important this topic is to me. Um, so it's important to me because I'm, my property is considered to be in tax district A and B. 
And uh, I have a very modest uh, cottage on Croker Court that my parents bought in 1975. Our dune is higher than it's ever been since that time. We don't get ocean flooding on our road. And um, I think it's really arbitrary and unfair that we would be put in both districts, A and B, and consequently be charged five times uh, the amount of tax as those who are in District B. Um, I really appreciated Mr. Gray's comments because even though I, I wasn't uh, schooled in all of the details, those are things that have been in my mind as to uh, this seems like a huge expense and is it really going to work? So um, I yesterday uh, paid my dollar and went out on the Avon Pier so I could kind of take a look at the shoreline um, north and south. And what I realized uh, in doing that and also then in driving along Oceanview <coughs> Drive to the southern end of Avon is that there, there really is just a specific area where there's a problem and that is along Ocean View Drive. And when I looked at those huge homes on both sides of Ocean View Drive, I, the first question that came to mind was whoever approved that zoning wise. <clears throat> um, I imagine that that is a big contribution to the problem. So um, as when I got to, to the, uh, went back out on 12 and got to the end of Avon and was there at the National Park, the, the dunes are huge. It's amazing the difference. So I'm not opposed to paying a fair share if it is decided um, that you know, you're going to go ahead with this beach nourishment. But I don't think that uh, people like me, which would be from due east and south on the ocean side, who uh, are not affected uh, by, the, by the erosion, should be included in paying for the five times the rate for the project. And I'm also concerned um, with being put in a district A and a district B, if that sets a precedent. And then that may um, affect my family for generations to come. Right now, my grandkids are the fourth generation to um, come to this island and love it here. And we're here as much as we can be. So, um, oh, <laughs> I, sh I should say that I'm not, uh, not hiding wearing the mask. I do have a compromised immune system, so that's why I do when I'm in a closed area. Uh, but I would like to, if it's permissible, say my name and my contact information because I have a feeling that there are a lot of people who aren't at this meeting who are just as concerned as I am or maybe even more concerned. And I think that there is a way that we could get together and um, continue to oppose this. So my name is Marianne Marcel, that's M-A-R-S-A-L. And uh, my email is my name, it's M-A-R-Y-A-N-N -N dot M-A-R-S-A-L at gmail.com. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Marcel. Other public comment from Buxton? No further comment from Buxton. With that, Mr. Chairman, we would close the public hearing on the Avon Beach nourishment. Um, there's no action for you to take now. When we get to the budget, uh, in the budget ordinance, <laughs> if you choose to go forward with that, is included uh, the tax district and the tax rate for that district, and you would be approving, if you approve the budget, you would also be approving that as well, unless you choose to take that out. So you would approve that all in one go in the next one, which then leads us into the next uh, public hearing, and this is a public hearing with regard to the manager's proposed 2022 budget. Uh, we presented this at the last meeting. Uh, at the last meeting, we went through it in detail, answered most of your questions. Um, since that time, there has been a few changes in the budget. I think there's a sheet on your uh, DS up there in front of you that has those changes. I think you're aware of most of those changes, but with that said, I'll let Dave go through those before we have the public hearing. Um, 
in the first section are the general fund changes, and, and um, I think all except one were mentioned by Bobby at the last meeting. Um, you wanted to add back in a leisure activity coordinator for Manu Youth Center facility. Then there's adjustment for the um, reclassify the position for the supervisor of that position. You wanted to add back in the requested librarian, uh, regional librarian supplement. Um, Association County Commissioner's dues came in a little bit more than what we anticipated. And all that's paid for by a reduction in the charge to the general fund for insurance, which is the third section I'll hit. Um, in the second section on the first page is the capital investment fund. Um, I'm asking you to put $100,000 into the health and human services uh, project. Uh, Doug <coughs> and I walked the building with Doug Chesson two weeks ago tomorrow, and they're doing a great job. It's renovation, and they're doing a really great job of addressing things as they go on. And what, the way they've kept it moving is Chesson's using their contingency. Every time they rip off a piece of wallpaper and there's a little bit of mold there, or we found one bathroom where there's a men's and a women's, and the women's was spec to be completely, it's a public restroom, completely remodeled, but somehow the men's didn't get touched. <laughs> so uh, he's used their contingency to keep rolling, but he's almost out of that contingency. There's around ten, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000 left. And I haven't talked to Doug, but I think what I'm gonna ask him to do is to use this to add to his contingency so he can keep just addressing things as they come along. Um, then the third item is the 75000 that we reduced the charge for the general fund. The third item is all on second page, and it's all the insurance fund. And, and really what happened was they told us to expect a, a pretty large property insurance rate increase, and that did not occur. So there was 195000 savings there. But then liability, general liability, auto insurance, and law enforcement officers' liability were up. <coughs> and then we're making some administrative <coughs> changes for um, some professional services for uh, some risk consulting. Um, that's it. Okay. Any questions about the changes before we go into the public hearing? All right, we'll open the public hearing. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a public hearing with regard to the proposed uh, Fiscal year 2022 budget. If you're here to speak on that issue, again, you'll have five minutes to speak. Again, it's not question and answer. We just want to hear your comments. Um, and I'll let you know uh, when, you're, when you have about a minute to go and your time is up. Uh, is there anyone here uh, in Manio that would like to speak with regard to the budget? Yes, sir. State your name and where you're from. Good morning, uh, commissioners, ladies and gentlemen in the audience. My name is uh, Lieutenant Guard from the Mans Harbor Fire Department. I am here today because uh, in the budget it was outlined roughly 45000 to uh, replace the roof on the Mans Harbor Community Building in which our fire department is located. Um, with that, I just came today to uh, bring to your attention, um, uh, before COVID happened, uh, we invited several uh, people to the building uh, for our annual awards dinner while we were there we toured the building <laughs> and uh, and in touring the building it was identified that uh, we are hitting some spatial uh, issues inside the building uh, specifically with regards to keeping our apparatus and other equipment inside the bays as they stand now um, in fact i don't have a picture presented to uh, to show you guys um, but there is actually a picture we're having to uh, get creative with our, uh, with our placement and whatnot inside the building. And so I just wanted to step up here today to uh, kind of address that and say that, that we uh, are looking to hopefully make some capital improvements to the building uh, and have the building hopefully inspected. There are some things, uh, some stress fractures and stuff inside the building that we would like to get addressed um, and taken care of if that is possible. And with that, we would also like to pursue the, uh, the potential to work with the county to uh, extend those bays and give us a little bit more room so that we can purchase the equipment necessary and uh, work through 
uh, that in due time. So I just wanted to bring that to you guys' attention as we move forward with this. And uh, thank you guys for everything that you guys do to, uh, to host us in that building and, and take care of that Mans Harbor complex. So, thank, thank you, guys. Lieutenant. Thank you, Lieutenant. Anyone else in Manny would like to speak to the budget? Uh, seeing none, we've moved to Buxton. Any speakers from Buxton? Yes, we have one speaker, Ms. Rosa Alice Mayo. Welcome, Ms. Mayo. Good morning. The water increase. Every penny counts since COVID. To toilet paper, paper towel has gone up. You can still get 48 rolls, but I think when we were all growing up, 12 rolls of toilet paper, that is now equals to 48 rolls. We must have had like two sheets on a roll when we were children. I am in a home that is very modest with one other person. Across from where I live is nothing but rental houses. There are three built, rented, 10 bedroom, <laughs> 10 bathroom houses. There are now three more in the process of being ready and they're building more behind that. And on the other side of the cabanas, I understand there may be as many as 25 more. All of these 10 bathroom houses also have swimming pools. I agree with the lady from Avon, fair price. I think that us local born bred native Hatteras Island people should not have to pay for the tourists to enjoy our beaches and to enjoy the conveniences. They are using so much more water than we could ever begin to use. I feel that it's unfair to charge all of us for everything. I don't know what the answer is. I don't know what the solution is, but I also know that these are businesses and these owners get to write some, if not all, of that off on their taxes. So that doesn't cost them a cent. And I am asking you all to really look at how you're charging us. Electricity, I'm sure, is gonna be the next thing. We that live here year round that are on fixed incomes, I'm a widow with a disabled son in my home. I don't have the luxury of keep dig digging into my pocketbook to try to keep food on the table, a roof over my head, and a vehicle that runs and continue to pay the prices that you are asking us to pay. So just read a look at that, please, and see if there's some way that you can make it fair for the people that are here year round. And I appreciate your time. Thank you, Ms. Mayo. Any other speakers from Buxton? No further comment from Buxton. Chairman, with that, we would close the public hearing. And now it's before you uh, to, if there's any questions about the budget, or if not, then a motion to approve the budget and in that motion include the uh, adoption of the, if you choose to do so, include the adoption of the Avon Service District and the tax rate of 20 cents for District A and 5 cents for District B. All right. What is the uh, pleasure of the board? Motion to approve, sir. Second. 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 Okay. We have um, uh, conducted a public hearing on the budget, and there's a motion on the floor by Commissioner Ross to approve the budget along with the, um, correct me if I'm right, wrong, um, county manager, the rates for the Avon Beach Nourishment. Creating the district. Creating the district. And, the, and, and adopting the rate. And, and, and adopting the rate. And that's also been um, seconded by Commissioner Couch, and I believe, uh, was it you, Commissioner Bateman? Okay. Sure. Uh, <clears throat> so, any floor is open for further discussion. Hearing none then, though, the, the uh, motion's on the floor, and it's seconded. Those in favor of the motion, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, aye. like sign. Motion carries unanimous. Chairman, at the appropriate time, I guess when we get to 6A, I can address some of Ms. Mayo's comments with regard to the water rates as well. Absolutely, if okay. you will. Sure. Did um, you hear that, Ms. Mayo? We'll go on to uh, item 6, and that's public comment. Ladies and gentlemen, now's the time that's been set aside for public comment. If you have public comment on any issue, uh, please uh, raise your hand or come to the podium. I don't I have 
a couple people signed up. Once again, you have five minutes, and the same rules will apply. On my sign-up sheet for here in Manio, I have Amanda Lotus. Are you going to speak one at a time or two? How are we doing Oh, that? she's just going to say a few words. Okay, yeah. sure. I'm, and you're Lisa? Liza. Liza, okay. Welcome this morning, lady. Hi, my name is Liza Yell, and I've been a Dare County um, resident for uh, over 20 years and a small business owner. And I'm just here to support what Amanda has to say about um, a Dare County resolution that was passed in 2012 that I think is really important to revisit. Hello, my name is Amanda Lotus. I live in Kill Devil Hills. Thanks for the opportunity to speak today. We are addressing you today in reference to Dare County Resolution 12-02-05 that was signed by Warren Judge on February 20th, 2012. This resolution opposes United Nations Agenda 21, also known as Agenda 2030, the Great Reset, and the Fourth Industrial Revolution. It resolved that the BOC recognize the destructive and insidious nature of United Nations Agenda 21 and urge the communities to reject these radical policies and destructive sustainable development strategies. When compared to residents of other towns and cities, people here have the great opportunity of owning and supporting small businesses while enjoying a simple life and the freedom of wide open spaces in nature. That's why we found it deeply disturbing when Justin Trudeau, the Prime Minister of Canada, announced that this pandemic has provided an opportunity for a reset. He was referring to the Great Reset, which was also recently heralded on the cover of Time magazine. It is the exact agenda that Dare County resolved to oppose back in 2012. How might this possibly affect our lives here on the Outer Banks? Actually, it's already being implemented and is set to seep into the fibers of every local government. This reset is being covertly pushed into local communities throughout the US by the International Council of Local Environmental Initiatives in the form of local sustainable development policies such as smart growth, wild lands project, resilient cities, regional visioning projects, and other green or alternative projects. In conjunction with this reset, the World Economic Forum, whose members include global, globalist billionaire leaders, heads of state, big pharma, and big tech, made some predictions for the year 2030. They include, number one, you'll own nothing and you'll be happy. Do you want your right to own land, a home, or a car eliminated? Number two, you'll eat much less meat, an occasional treat, not a staple, for the good of the environment and our health. In other words, food, resources, and rations will be theirs to choose. Did you know that Bill Gates owns more farmland in the US than any other private farmer? having purchased 242,000 acres in the past few years, including within North Carolina. And also to speak to this, I don't know if you all are aware of a ballot initiative recently in Oregon that seeks to criminalize animal husbandry. And so this means that people wouldn't be able to raise animals for their own food, like we've been doing for millennia. You couldn't raise uh, your own chickens or cattle. The only way that you'd be able to um, eat the food or have food production as if the animal is sick or dies of old age. So that's a ballot initiative in Oregon right now. Number three, polluters will have to pay to emit carbon dioxide. There will be a global price on carbon dioxide. This will he help make fossil fuels history. The reality is that under the Paris Accord, China pollutes 11 billion tons of carbon, and in 2030, that number is allowed to go up to 20 billion. There's more pollution coming, not less. Do our small businesses, business owners really want to pay more taxes? Number four, Western values will have been tested to the breaking point. Do we want our American constitutional rights taken away? Who wouldn't want to achieve the goals of a clean, sustainable future, zero poverty and hunger, and a decrease in greenhouse gases? However, under the guise of humanitarianism, this reset will bit by bit erode many of our rights. If you doubt that any of this could happen in America, you can ask someone who comes from Cuba, Venezuela, or any other country that was conquered by communism. Soviet politician Nikita Khrushchev's prophecy of America's fate is one we are seeing unfold before our eyes. He said, you Americans are so gullible. No, you won't accept communism outright, but we'll keep feeding you small doses of socialism until you'll finally wake up and find you already have communism. We won't have to fight you. We'll so weaken your economy until you'll fall like overripe fruit into our hands. We do not have to invade the United States. We will destroy you from within. 
Our local businesses are struggling to keep employees because it is proven to be more lucrative to collect unemployment. This is one clear example of our government fostering financial dependency, destruction of small businesses, and therefore America from within. Meanwhile, the Dare County Health and Human Services attempted to run the Safer Spot campaign that actually discriminated against businesses with fewer vaccinated employees. As long as your time is just about up. Okay. Well, we just ask that you look very closely at what the Great Reset is all about. And we plan to email y'all, if that's all right, uh, this letter. And also, we have some copies here. So thanks. I appreciate it. Thanks. Please, please do that, ladies. Yes, Thank, you. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank, Thank you for Thank your you comments. Sir. Other public comment in, from here in Mania. Anybody else? Seeing none here, is there any public comment from Buxton? Yes. Our first speaker, Ms. Rosa Alice Mayo. Hello again. It's so nice to be able to talk to you guys in person again. Um, going back to the water increase, when I did a business out of my home before Isabel, I had to go before the planning board and I had to get a user permit to do business out of my home. These big houses that are rented are a business. How come they are not charged a user permit? I had to pay $150 per year for the six years that I ran a business in my home. Do you realize how much money you would generate for this county by charging them a user permit? And again, that would be a tax write-off for them, so it really would cost them nothing at the end. My biggest concern today is between Hatteras and Frisco, Highway 12. Coming up this morning, I can see the ocean from my little escape car. We don't even need a storm uh, called a hurricane to take that road out again. I, as a Hatteras Village resident, want to know what your plans are for Hatteras Village in the event of a storm. Without that road, we are up the proverbial creek. We have no medical facility in Hatteras Village any longer. It is in Avon. I don't even know if the local doctors from Avon are allowed to practice medicine anywhere in Hatteras Village if the need were to arise. With no road, and the ferries probably may not be running because the inlet is closed, how are you going to get sick and injured people off of the island if the weather's bad and the helo can't come in here? You all need to figure out what you're going to do to provide safety for us. And I know evacuation is the very first thing you're going to say. Well, with the COVID, it has taught us one thing. You can go to a clean hotel, but you don't know who slept in that bed, who slept on those pillows, were under those covers. They may be clean, but are they sanitized? If you have someone in your family that has an immune compromised disease, you are putting them at jeopardy. So you all need to consider that a lot of us never leave because it's too hard to get back. And I heard on the news for Greenville, where I have evacuated several times, 84 of their police officers have left their job this year. They're not responding <coughs> to calls for theft and burglaries and stuff. So where are we going to go that we're safe now? So I hope that you all look at Highway 12. It's not a beach nourishment list, but you all need to figure out what you're going to do to provide safety, mail, medicine, medical care, supplies for us to sustain ourselves so i ask that you really look at this seriously john couch danny couch i hope that you're paying attention you're our county commissioner we depend on you to take care of us in hatteras village and i appreciate your time oh and just one more thing the hatteras inlet is a mess and it needs to be taken care of and mr woodard i spoke with you in january to commend you and Ms. Dr. Sheila Davies on the wonderful operation of getting my COVID shot. It was like clockwork. And I spoke to you then about the lines on the road from Oregon Inlet to the Ocracoke Ferry. It was a three car accident on the Sandy Bay stretch, Highway 12 yesterday. The lines are awful. And at night you can see nothing. And if it's raining, forget it. So please do something about the lines on the road for Highway 12. We have all these visitors here. They need to know if they can pass, not pass, and where the bicycle lanes are. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Mayo. Um, 
Uh, Ms. Mayo, can, can you hear me? I, I feel the need to respond um, to a couple of um, your comments. Um, you may or may not be aware I formed a task force, NC-12 task force, uh, along with NCDOT representatives and uh, park superintendent and a, new, a num number of other folks from uh, um, NCDOT to uh, study the six hot spots in 12 and develop a long-term plan. And we've, we've had several meetings and we'll continue to meet. And, and we're also seeking funding to address those hot spots. Uh, the, uh, the other issue with the Hatteras Inlet, uh, our staff worked diligently, filed, filed a request back the 21st of May uh, to do to get a special permit to dredge. That dredge uh, should be here this week. We got permission to do so. That dredge should be here Wednesday of this week for two to five days to try to open that up. So I, I uh, uh, just wanted you to be aware of those two issues. County Manager. Is there other public comment from Buxton? Yes, next speaker, Mr. Belton Gray. Welcome again, Mr. Gray. Thank you, sir. I appreciate it. Um, it would appear that the answer to most of our problems now is beach nourishment. Um, I just would like to pose one question to the Dare County Board of Commissioners. When the sand is gone, and it will be, will you repeal this unjust tax? Thank you. Once again, Mr. Gray, I, I feel the need to respond to you. With, when you spoke of the amount of sand lost in the Buxton project, we're fortunate that we uh, will have, we do a pre and post uh, measurement of sand that's lost. And just to correct you with respect to the amount of sand that was lost in Buxton to that 18 project, we will be, uh, we have applied for uh, FEMA reimbursement of the sand that was lost. And we have been approved to receive that. Is that not correct, uh, 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 Mr. Clawson? So just to uh, just to correct your your um, comments about that, Mr. Gray, we're the sand that was lost in that storm and that nourishment project. We are being reimbursed by FEMA uh, to put that sand back on the beach. County Manager, uh, excuse other me, sir. Can other I public comment from Buxton. Any other public comment? No further comment. And with that, Mr. Chairman, we would close the public comment. And that brings us to item now, which is 6A, which is the commissioner's business and the manager's business. Yeah, that's, uh, I've just been asked if we could take a short recess. So we're going to take a five-minute break here real quick. Okay, I'm going to call the uh, Dare County Board of Commissioners meeting back to order. And that brings us to item 6A. Um, normally we go to commissioners and then county manager, but I'm going to ask the county manager to go first uh, on, on this uh, item uh, this Mr. morning. Mr. Chairman, I don't have anything for you to act on, but I do want to address Ms. Mayo on the water rates. Um, a couple of things that she said talking about the bigger houses. We do have a graduated rate. We have a minimum rate that you get a certain amount of water. I don't remember what that is, but you get a minimum rate. A minimum, you pay a minimum rate for that volume of water, and then as your water use goes up, your rate goes up. So those houses that she's talking about that are swim, filling their swimming pools and, and doing those things are paying more for water than those people who aren't doing those things to have smaller houses. Uh, that minimum rate was put there to protect the fixed income people like Ms. Mayo and others and on purpose, and when the board adopted the rate plan several years ago, that's what they did. Uh, with regard to the current rate, the 2% increase that's in the current budget is a 2% rate increase. It's been in the plan for a while. There, it, it sort of follows inflation, the cost of chemicals and water treatment and all that go up. But if you look at a minimum rate, uh, the minimum monthly rate's about $40 <coughs> a month. And so if you add 2% to that, then someone who's using a minimum amount of water, their rate's going to go up about $0.96 cents, uh, per month. So it's not a huge increase. Um, and then the other thing, I, we were just looking, uh, Dave has a graphic that he gets where you 
compare our water rates to other rates in northeast North Carolina. Um, we're below average. I don't, we're among the lowest rates in the northeast uh, North Carolina, the Albemarle region. And so our rates are low to start with. This is a, a minimal, it's a, a 90, on a minimum rate, it's about a 96 cent increase. And it is a graduated rate so that people who use more are paying for it and the people that use small amounts are subsidizing uh, the larger rates. So I think that addresses the concerns. The only other thing she said, something about being a resident and they should get less. It's illegal to, to single out whether you <coughs> live in Virginia or whether you live in North Carolina. Our rate has to be done somehow on use, not on what your address happens to be. So we can't, really can't do anything about that. But we, with the minimum rate, we've tried to get to the problem that she's talking about. Thank you so much, County Manager, for clarifying that. Um, Ms. Hester, do you have anything this morning for us? Okay. Um, Mr. Clawson, finance director, do you have anything else for us? Oh, I do have one thing, and it's to correct something I told you last meeting, Bobby, and I've been going through more of the American Rescue Plan money. I think affordable housing on that funds is probably yes. There was another section. <coughs> Dave, where could you explain just briefly what American Rescue Plan is again? for folks that might not be as familiar? It's, it's the second round of the federal stimulus money, and our share is 7182000 We have to have it obligated by December 31st, 2024, and spent by December 31st, 2026. So, so, so that's Dare County's $7 million. Yes. And it's got to be committed for projects by the end of 2024. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, and with respect to that, we had told you that we had to be in a census district or something like that and that we were not in. And as the finer print came out, there are some cri other criteria that we can use that are COVID-related. Um, the idea that people are, are pulling their houses out of or coming down to uh, live because of COVID here and, and pulling their houses out of programs and, and reducing our rental markets gives us a COVID relationship that may allow us to get to that money. And so we think we got an opportunity there. Uh, in the next few meetings in the short run, we've got to make some decisions on what we're going to do with that money because if we have to get it committed by December and any of it requires bidding, then we've got a bid process to go through and that kind of thing. So we've got to make some decisions. We had talked once about stormwater, using it for that. We've talked about affordable housing. There are other things on that list that we can do, and so uh, we, we may need to get together, Mr. Chairman, and, and have some discussions and <coughs> start making some decisions on how to use some or all of that money or allocate it among different projects or all for one. Uh, we talked about broadband at one point, um, so we've talked about several things, but we're at a point where we've got to make some decisions pretty soon. Great. We'll, we'll um, certainly, um, I think we'd, uh, that, um, I think it would be beneficial on our part to have a special meeting to uh, yes, discuss those or, issues. Or if you would rather, we can do it through the CIP, project, like the CIP meet like we would do other capital projects and come back to the board with recommendations might be a better use of your time. Yeah, we could do that as well, absolutely. Thank you, County Manager. <clears throat> um, Commissioner House, do you mind kicking it off sure. today? Sure, sure. Um, the North Carolina, Carolina Fisheries Commission, um, they voted to take the uh, draft shrimp fisheries management plan amendment two out for public comment and advisory review. Uh, the draft amendment focused on reducing bycatch of non-target species and minimizing habitat uh, impacts. Uh, this includes a suite of options ranging broadly from status quo, keeping everything the way it is, to a complete closure of in all inside waters, including the Pamlico Sound, to shrimp trawling. Um, the Division of Marine Fisheries will announce the public comment period and advisory committee meetings uh, by a news release in the next week or so. Um, also, uh, the Marine Fisheries Commission received an update on the Southern Flounder. Division Director Kathy Wall Rawls uh, reviewed the updated timeline for Amendment 3 to the Southern Mount Flounder Fishery Management Plan uh, following the amended uh, allocation uh, decision by the Commission. 
at their March meeting, the uh, draft, uh, revised draft for Amendment 3 is scheduled to be re uh, reviewed and potentially approved for public and advisory committee review. Um, Rawls also told the Commission Division plans to shorten the commercial and recreational flounder season for 2021 because the flounder harvest in both sectors in 2019 and 2020 did not meet the reduction approval for the Southern Flounder Fishery Management Plan Amendment 2. Um, so those are two very indinct th in in decisive things that are going to happen here fairly quickly. Um, and also uh, the draft amendment to the shrimp fishery management plan um, is a little bit more in depth uh, as far as uh, what the modifications are um, and for like a reduction in uh, shrimp nets and also redu reduction in, in effort. Um, and also to that, um, the shrimp management of special secondary nursery areas, creating a permanent or seasonal, cl seasonal closures in the Pamlico Sound region. So those are very uh, distinct differences that we want to definitely take a closer look at. Um, and also at our last uh, meeting um, on the uh, shrimp trawling, or not, well, not shrimp trawling mainly, but for uh, nets and gill nets, um, there was a House bill or in the Senate bill that went through uh, that was floating into the, uh, the House. Um, and I told you I would keep a closer eye on it. If something came up on that, I would definitely address the board with if we needed to put out a resolution or whatever. Um, I am uh, pleased to say that that bill died in committee. So it's, it will not hit the floor. Um, and that's it on our fisheries update. Our day in history is a very important day. Uh, on this day, June 7th, 1776, Richard Henry Lee, he was an American statesman, founder, founding father of Virginia, and uh, he was the, uh, he was in the first Continental Congress to be a delegate, and in Lee's, uh, in the second con Continental uh, Congress, he was the uh, president pro tempore of the upper house of Senate. On this day, he sent out a resolution was approved by the Senate and the house by the continental Congress. Here's his resolve that these United colonies are and of right ought to be free and independent States that they are absolved from the a legacy of the British crown and that all political connection between them and the states of Great Britain is and ought to be totally dissolved. <coughs> Upon this resolution, a document was written. That document, the Declaration of Independence. This was the first step in gaining our independence from Britain. And that's our day in history. And with that, thank you very much. Thank you, Commissioner House. Um, I like hearing them history uh, uh, tidbits. It's uh, quite interesting to hear those uh, uh, our past history and what's taking place. Well, we don't. If we don't learn from our past, we can't govern our future. Gotcha. Absolutely, Commissioner uh, Ross. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Pleasure to be here and join you all in person today. Thank you. Uh, I just had a couple of quick items, if I may piggyback mm -hmm. on Commissioner House. I know we're a day past, but in recognition of the 77th anniversary of the Normandy invasion and D-Day, yesterday was the celebration and recognition of that incredible feat of bravery and heroism by the uh, Allied forces, which obviously went on to stop fascism in Europe and the rest of the world. So I know we all remembered that yesterday. I just thought I'd call it out quickly this morning and, and recollect, so thank you. Thank you. Uh, number two, thanks for the budget. Very well done. County manager, finance director, 
excellent document, balanced, clear, thorough. We've spent many hours reviewing it with you. Your staff, Dave, Sally DeFossi, Ernie, others I know that I can't mention them all have contributed many, many hours to the diligence, uh, thoroughness, transparency, and effort in the budget. So I just want to call that out in our, my appreciation. I'm sure I speak for the board on that as well. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you for that video on the COA topping ceremony. That was pretty exciting stuff to see that building erected and how quickly the steel has gone up, the roof is on, and uh, I apologize I, I wasn't able to be there in person, but that was terrific. Were your names on the beam, my friend? Yes, sir. Yep, yep. <laughs> <laughs> Made sure of that. Thank you all. Last item, I happened to be at dinner on uh, Saturday evening at one of our very prominent local restaurants, and I was chatting with the owner. And he was explaining in very graphic and up-close detail what we've been talking about, and I'm looking at Commissioner Bateman as a local restaurant owner. His, and I will use the term crisis, in finding employees. This particular restaurant even had the luxury of offering housing for employees unable to source and bring in those employees. The restaurant was currently operating at about, he told me, 60% capacity. 40% they simply couldn't open because they don't have people to do it from cook, chef, to dishwasher, to table busser, to restaurant server. And housing remained one of those key issues. So as your opening comments describe, Mr. <coughs> Chairman, it is simply reinforced to me in graphic technicolor detail every time I go out into the community how much this is needed and how much we, or how high the priority is for us to act. So I just wanted to share that personal experience and reinforce what we've been saying for, well, many months now. Yeah. Thank you, sir, that's all I have. Thank you. Rob, I will add yes, sir. Uh, about the, uh, uh, the employee situation. Uh, yes, sir. It's, it's not just affecting restaurants. It's across yes. the board. Um, I well know said. personally in my company, well I, I'm, I'm searching for it. Uh, there's plumbers, electricians that just need helpers, nobody with no experience. And they'll train them to get that experience. And actually some of these contractors like myself, I will train you and actually prepare you to take your own certification. But yet I still can't find anybody. So it's not just... The this, restaurants yeah. is across Thank the Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Commissioner Ross. Commissioner Tobin? Yes. Um, Saturday night I attended the NCGOP uh, convention down in, uh, in Greenville and uh, saw couple, one old friend. Uh, I've known David Rouser, who's a congressman <laughs> for 26 years, and it was really, really good running into him. And also Congressman Grade Murphy was there. We had... Uh, quite a detailed conversation with both of them about um, our permitting process that we're going through with the dredge. And they assured me that they had our backs and to let them know if we ran into any real issues with it. Um, also, I talked with them a little bit about workforce housing and uh, just wondered if, you know, what the federal government could do uh, for us. Uh, and then yesterday, much to my surprise, at 10.30 in the morning, I got a phone call uh, asking if I could get the Speaker of the House, Tim Moore, out uh, on a boat to go through Oregon Inlet and look at what the problems were out there. And, uh, I was very lucky that one of our charters had been canceled because we were booked solid for the next few months. And so I took Speaker Moore out. Um, was with him for about three hours, which was really nice. We went in depth on workforce housing and uh, funding from the state, what kind of funding we could get. It was a very encouraging discussion. And also uh, we spoke at length about uh, the dredging needs at Hatteras Inlet and the challenges down there uh, and possible long-term solutions. Uh, he, he brought up jetties and groins and I, I was excited to hear that. Uh, then we also, of course, we were in Oregon Inlet, so we went all, we went all the way out to the sea buoy and the whole way we talked about what our needs were there and funding and the fact that it would be really nice if they changed the, the uh, funding to a 
one quarter, three quarter match rather than a one third, two third match, and, and he was open to that. So, anyways, good productive meeting, and uh, that's all I got. Thank you, Commissioner Toby. Commissioner Count? Yep, I just uh, want to piggyback on uh, Commissioner Ross. That is a good budget, and thanks everyone for your input. Uh, but other than that, I don't have anything of consequence today. Thank you, Commissioner Couch. Commissioner Bateman. Yes, sir. Um, I've got on, on the opposite end of the broad spectrum to talk about, but the, the first thing I want to just throw out there to y'all, and just kind of like a public service kind of announcement. In the last two weeks, we've lost two uh, young people to um, overdose yeah. near county. Um, I know both of them. The one individual um, went out for with some friends and happened to do a recreational drug that was laced with fentanyl, um, and he died. And um, I spoke with the, the family and so forth, and I know the family. He used to work for me at one time. And it's really, really sad that um, he made that decision, but it's also really, really sad that um, our society has gotten to the point um, that um, we're losing these fine young people to this. Now, having said that, I, I just want to throw this out there. If you know anybody that's out there suffering, listen, put them in touch with a preacher, put them in touch with a professional. Um, like I said, call me, call anyone in the um, recovery community, and they'll be glad to get you to a meeting, to get you hooked up with someone, to get you into a detox, or to get you into a treatment center. There's no reason why in Dare County you cannot get help for opioids or any kind of drug or alcohol problem. And having said that, I want to compliment this board. You guys have gone beyond the call of duty uh, while they were hitting up the Saving Lives Task Force with their appropriation of money. So an uh, individual who wants to get to a detox, you know, the Sheriff's Department will take you. Uh, there's, there's no reason why you can't fix this problem or at least try to uh, uh, address it. Is killing families. I mean, this, these family members, one individual has two kids. The other one was just a young man growing up in, in life and excellent ball player and just a good guy. And he just made one bad decision. And so, um, but we, we have to be open-minded about it and we have to not give up ever and understand that this is something we need to address as a community and, um, and, and as family. <coughs> we need to make sure our families address it. Um, the other, um, like some broadside, I've got six high school kids who work for me. Gosh, good kids, y'all. And I think, I believe two or three of them is in, in the, the dual enrollment program. Um, they're taking the separate courses and so forth in order to graduate. So, and they're um, uh, sophomore and juniors and seniors in high school. So, um, I've got good kids there, and they're, and, they're, and that's benefiting them. I know this because the fact the first thing out of my mouth when I have a young one come in there, you know that Dare County, if you graduate, we're going to send you to college. And that's, that's big, y'all. You know, that didn't happen years ago. So once again, this board has stepped up to the plate and um, helped out. Um, thanks again for the budget. Uh, you guys did a great job on that. And to the spinoff of, of Steve House and Rob's thing about the work. The other thing is we need to find people who want to work. I mentioned the ones I have working for me, the high school kids. That's a great thing. But uh, I'm telling you, the people that are 25 to 40 years old really don't want to work. I don't know what the deal is. I'm, I'm losing those guys, but I'm gaining the younger ones. So... Um, I can't figure it out, but um, I, I am blessed with a good staff. I'm blessed for being open. I got, I got business, Danny. <laughs> I mean, I got we got business, and I'm very, very fortunate with that. So, um, thanks for letting me share. Thank you, Commissioner Baker. Yep, appreciate it. Good stuff. Uh, Vice Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, with regard to what Urban was just saying, as long as it just in general, as long as people are paid not to work, there's a whole lot of them not going to work. Let's yes, face it. And as soon as that's recognized and dealt with, you're probably going to continue along the road we're on. Uh, I want to say congratulations and thanks to our service pen recipients, Troy, Laurie, and Sean, for their 60 years of service to Dare County. That's a, that's a lot of service for three people on average, and uh, we certainly appreciate it. Dare County could not run without you. 
I also want to say congratulations again to the graduates who uh, attained their associate degrees. That's a special thing. Thank you. I know you'll be con continuing your education further, and uh, we appreciate the efforts that you made uh, while you were in Dare County Schools. Uh, I'll join the other commissioners in saying thanks to the budget, Bobby, Dave, and all your, all your uh, staff. Thank you so much. You did a great job, and we really appreciate it, and really appreciate you helping us understand it <laughs> as, as much or more. Thank <laughs> you. Uh, and that's all I have. Thank you, Vice Chairman. Um, one thing I failed to mention under the Chairman's comments is um, we've had 20,477 individuals fully vaccinated in Dare County. That's about 55.3%. And then we've had 21,969 individuals who have received their first dose, and that's about 59.4% of our population. I believe we rank number two in the state for uh, vaccines. So um, that's pretty incredible. Uh, those of you who, who have not, certainly uh, consider it. It's a personal choice, and the, uh, the, the source is there. So if you wish to do it, we certainly can uh, get you vaccinated. That uh, completes the commissioner's business, county manager's business. <coughs> and so I believe that will take us back to item 7. Is that correct? Right. Yes, sir, Mr. Item 7 is Ted Musley with Outer Banks Gas and the LP. It's here for a conditional use permit, and Noah Gillum with our planning department will make that presentation. Good morning, Noah. Good morning, Commissioners. A request for a condition. Before we start, previous to this hearing, all of the people that are going to speak have been sworn, so this is all sworn testimony. All right. A request for a conditional use permit for a liquefied petroleum gas storage sales and service facility has been submitted by Ted Mosley. The proposed facility is located in East Lake and is identified as parcel 01756002 with the Dare County tax mapping. The parcel is zoned East Lake Commercial Services and liquefied petroleum gas storage sales and service facilities are permitted as a conditional use. The applicant currently operates Outer Banks Gas and LP, an LP gas and storage and ser service facility on Roanoke Island and is looking to relocate the business to a larger parcel. There is currently an existing vacant dwelling on the property that the applicant intends to demolish. The applicant is proposing to install one 30,000 gallon bulk LP tank and three 1,000 gallon LP tanks on the property. The tanks will be placed on and adjacent to a 9,945 square foot gravel drive, parking, and work area. The gravel area will be placed on site so that it meets the NCDOT and emergency vehicle load requirements. It is the applicant's plan to construct a new 20 by 44 um, building to serve as an office and storage area and an 80 by 24 covered open air structure to serve as storage service area for tanks and equipment. The facility will have perimeter fencing and gating as required by the North Carolina Department of Agriculture and the Dare County Zoning Ordinance. As part of the CUP application, the applicant has submitted an Appendix B that shows the proposed improvements and a copy is attached to the, mem the memo that you provided. The proposed facility will primarily serve as a location for the bulk storage of LP gas equipment in a service area and office space for the employees. The day-to-day -day operation of the business primarily occurs off-site in the form of deliveries and service calls. The applicant does not intend for the facility to operate as a retail facility, but has provided parking in front of the proposed office structure for parking in the event a customer needs to visit the office. All parking improvements are depicted on the Appendix B and meet the requirements of the Dare County Zoning Ordinance. Hours of operation have been added to the draft CUP that reflects the Dare County Noise Ordinance. The applicant felt that these hours gave him the flexibility that is often needed during inclement weather events. The Dare County Planning Board reviewed the proposed CUP at their May 10th, 2021 meeting and recommended approval. 
The Dare County Fire Marshal has reviewed the site plan and conditions have been added to the draft CUP addressing his comments. A fire protection plan has also been created that will be provided to the fire marshal, the local fire department, and the planning department once the improvements are installed on site. Liquefied petroleum storage and service facilities are regulated by the Department of Agriculture. The applicant has indicated that after the Dare County approval, the site plan and site will be reviewed and inspected by the Department of Agriculture. A condition has been added to the CUP stating that all applicable operation approvals and permits shall be supplied to the Dare County Planning Department. A draft CUP and site plan is attached for the board's review. Any other conditions may be added to the draft CUP if needed as a result of, the, of today's review. And the applicant and his project engineer are here as well to answer any questions. Can I imagine? Yes, sir. Mr. Mosley, could you come up? You've been sworn, correct? Yes. I just, I've got a couple questions to ask. Um, one, do you consent to uh, placing your file that the planning staff has into evidence in this matter? Yes, sir. Okay, and that you confirm and agree with the testimony that you just heard from Noah? Yes, sir. All right, and then do you agree to the terms of the CUP as it's now presented? Yes, sir. Okay. Good deal. Thank you, Mr. Mosley. Thank you for being there. Hang tight, just in case. Uh, I'm going to ask the board if they got any questions. Does the board have any concerns? Questions? No. All right. Then um, what's the pleasure of the board? Motion to approve. Okay. As a, as a motion on the board by Commissioner Bateman to approve your CUP, and it's been seconded by Commissioner Tobin over there. So um, any further comments? Hearing none, then those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, like sign. Motion carries unanimous. John, you got it off light, yeah. my friend. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, good. Glad, I'm glad. It's good you seeing were, you. I'm glad you were here. Where do you get my belt? Get a Chairman, that leads us to item eight on the, on the agenda. This is a preliminary plat review for the Hatteras Island Reserve subdivision, and Donna Creep, our planning director, will make that presentation. Good morning, Donna. Good morning. As Mr. Alton said, this is a preliminary subdivision plat for the Hatteras Island Reserve subdivision, and it's a rare day that I come in front of the board with the subdivision plat because the subdivision ordinance is set up that the planning board is typically the review and approval agency for that, unlike the conditional use permit that we just uh, had the board approve. Um, the ordinance, the subdivision ordinance is specific in that subdivisions that feature a common drive do have to come to the board of commissioners for approval, and they also have to make the determination that the common drive that is proposed is not danger or diminish public health, safety, and welfare. The plat that's been included in your packet is for the proposed subdivision. It is actually three existing parcels in Hatter's Village. Um, one of the parcels includes the Seagull Motel. That property is not being affected by the subdivision um, that the motel will continue to operate. The property is being reconfigured a couple of the property lines to create four new lots. You'll see those four new lots. They will be served by the common drive <coughs> that is a 40-foot right-of-way with a proposed 24-foot wide improved common drive. Two of the lots will be accessed off of the uh, eastern side of the common drive and two of the lots will be accessed off the western side. And then the common drive splits into a driveway that serves the two oceanfront houses. Um, the common drive is proposed to alleviate the need for four driveway cuts on NC-12. And in the discussions of the subdivision, the planning board did make the determination that the common drive did not endanger or uh, diminish public health, safety, and welfare. So that determination was part of the planning board's recommendation. The lots do meet the minimum lot size requirements of the subdivision. The fire marshal has reviewed the plat, and it is his recommendation as well as the planning staff's recommendation that no parking signs be installed along the common drive to, uh, to ensure that none of the residents or visitors to those houses block the common drive so that service vehicles or 
ambulances or fire trucks can't get up there um, the planning board did review this at their May 10th meeting and make a recommendation and I'll stop right there the project manager from Quibble is here if you have any questions that I can't answer but I'll stop right there and the requested action today is a motion to approve the plat thank you Donna any questions of Donna I have one Donna I, I, I tried to find it on that drawing Donna but there was some verbiage in there that said if if the common drive is a hundred feet or less you don't have to have a turnaround point if it's uh, approaching 200 feet or something like that you do have to have it i, I yeah. couldn't find it. maybe yes sir that's it. actually in the subdivision ordinance where that language is coming from that requirement that sets the 100 feet and so they've capped the the 100 feet there and <coughs> the the driveways for the two front lots will be accessed off of that so uh, since the ordinance doesn't preclude or doesn't require the turnaround, there will not be one there. But the park, no parking signs are intended to make sure that that width is kept wide open. So, so does that mean uh, a garbage truck that goes in there would, would won't have a place to turn around? I would imagine that the garbage, the trash cans will be placed down at NC-12 and that they will not be going in there. They'll be door-to-door -door pickup along that. Gotcha. So even though there's not four driveways, there's still adequate area there for those trash cans to be there. So the trash truck won't be going Perfect. down the common okay. drive. That was my concern. Thank you. Just so you know, um, trash collection, it's incumbent upon the property owners to provide us access. We don't provide access. And if we can't access it, we won't pick it up. So they're going to have to make it in a place where we can get the trucks in and out, which I'm sure that will do. Perfect. Thank you. Gotcha. Anyone else? Okay, with that being said, what's the pleasure of the board? Motion to approve. Okay, is it motion on the floor by Commissioner Tobin to recommend preliminary plat approval and concurrence of use of common drive as recommended by the planning board? And it Sorry. was seconded by Commissioner House. Any further discussion? Hearing none, those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, like sign. Motion carries unanimous. Thank, Thank you so you, much. Tom. Chairman, items 9 and 10 are requests from the uh, Dare County Tourism Board for expenditure from restricted funds for the event site number 4525 and one for restricted fund capital improvements from lot item 4503. Lee Nettles is here to present both of those, and so I'd ask him to come forward now. Welcome this morning, Lee. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, Board of Commissioners. Um, as Bobby explained, I... I'm here before you today to request your consent on two items, the first of which is an expenditure from uh, line item 4525 with regard to the event site. Um, as you uh, perhaps know, back in 2007 and 2008 when the purchases were made on the original three parcels, the town of Nags Head contributed to make that possible, to make that purchase possible. Uh, that since then, we, we've been under a memorandum of understanding. Well, actually, MOU came a little bit later. Uh, but we operate now under an MOU with the town that gives the Tourism Board uh, responsibility for the, the management of the site and the responsibility for any additional purchases that have uh, happened since then or improvements made to the property. The town is a minority uh, interest in it, a silent partner. The town approached the Tourism Board a while back about uh, purchasing their interest in the site. They had other priorities for those dollars and uh, wished to, uh, to take advantage of that and reallocate those dollars if possible. The, it doesn't change the Tourism Board's position to be a full owner. Uh, we, we have control uh, as far as the management of the site goes right now under the MOU. Um, the, the town However, throughout that period, and even with the MOU, uh, has the rights and responsibilities of a municipality. So any improvements that would be made there uh, to date, and, and you know, uh, if we should purchase their ownership interest, it would remain the same that the ordinances are in effect as they have been. Um, so it, although it doesn't change the Tourism Board's position, per se, the town of Nags had helped us back then to make the purchase of the property possible and the tourism board wants to help the town now. Um, so uh, the, the uh, agreement that we've discussed and that the tourism board approved unanimously involves a multi-year deal with uh, 600,000 paid out 
within the current fiscal year, and then uh, 10 years of payments thereafter with minimum payments of 100,000. We, we tried to develop a, a way to pay them back that, that wouldn't um, tie up the funds so much that it would preclude us from being able to do other development out there, such as the boardwalk project that uh, we most recently brought before you. So with that, I would, I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Lee. I will ask the board if they have any questions. Commissioner Ross. Yes. Hi, Lee. Good morning. Good morning. What was the um, purchase that NAGS had contributed in 2007? The, the amount that, um, that we intend to pay them back, uh, $2,336,107. So that's exactly that's, that's the amount the that, they that they paid in. in 2007? Yes, sir. 2007 and, and 2008. It was two separate purchases. Two separate. But, and yes, what sir. percentage ownership did that represent of the property? Do you recall? Uh, collectively, it's, it's <laughs> close to about 28%, I think. So the initial purchase was well over $10 million for the property. Yeah, I don't. I don't have. No, I'm not trying to get the right number. I'm in just front saying. Of me, but um, the, the their share of interest in those two purchases was different, but it, it rounds out to you know around 20, 27, 28 percent. Right, right. And is there a time specific date upon which the MOU is to be satisfied that the nag said must be uh, bought out, so to speak, or repaid? The MOU has no time limit. So it could be now, it could be six months, could be next year. The MOU could continue indefinitely. Right, right. So my question was, uh, I saw this when I went through it on Friday. I, I wasn't aware we were proposing a $2.3 million commitment with the, until I saw it in the packet. And I, I'm curious, would it be why now, I guess, because we're in the midst, as we've had on our event site subcommittee meetings, uh, quite a bit of difficulty moving off of top dead center in terms of whether the site remains as is with the, the abandoned Pamlico Jack's restaurant, a large open field that hosts the seafood festival or an occasional carnival, and that's it. I mean, that's basically other than, I don't know if we have events there other than that, but those are the two that come to mind. If, if that's the future for the site, then why are we doing this? Well, I, th I think that, that we have a process, and as you mentioned, uh, the work of the advisory committee is, is part of that, and I think that we're quickly approaching a point where the advisory committee is going to be able to react to a specific plan uh, that would be proposed, assuming that the committee wants to bring that forward to the Tourism Board as a recommendation. The Tourism Board would take that upon itself. The, the town of Nags Head, um, as I mentioned, operates under its current set of ordinance. The building that is being discussed and, and I expect will be proposed um, has not been built in the town before, so it's not uh, unexpected that variances would be requested and, and the town representatives on that committee have said as much. Um, they are unable to offer uh, variance, um, variances in the absence of a specific plan. So, um, yeah, wouldn't, wouldn't it be prudent then to just hold off this decision until we resolve this unresolved major question? This is a huge strategic question. It is. Well, um, I. I think that the, the, the plan that we've tried to uh, pull together for purchasing their ownership interest allows us to to buy them out. Um, now again, it's not, this buying them out has nothing to do with the strategic plan of what's to use that site for, or does it? It, it does not. So that's my question. Why wouldn't we resolve the strategic use of the site prior to repurchasing the share of the minority owner, the town of Nags Head? Well, um, as you've stated, they, I think that we can, do, we can do both independently of one another. Hmm. Now, once we've bought out Nags Head and returned them their money, they still hold all in full control over any ordinances, variances, or any other approvals that might be necessary for use of the site. As, as they've had throughout our relationship with right. them. Right, yes. right. And continuing so, on. So should they be reluctant or not willing to consent to, and which is certainly within their purview, 
to any ordinances. We could well have the open fields and abandoned Pamlico Jacks for forever. There's one provision within the MOU that says that neither the town nor the tourism board can sell their interest in the property except to the other. Um, so, you know, presumably with full ownership, we would be able to sell our interest in the property. We would be able to sell the property, and we cannot now. I don't expect that it would come to that, and, and I do believe that we've shown um, uh, the ability to grow events on that site, and now with COVID kind of, uh, you know, lifting or at least being able to have events out there again, uh, I expect that we'll, that we'll have uh, strong development with events. It, the work of the advisory committee, the strategic plan that you... Oh, yeah. Mentioned. Believe me, I'm very um, well aware of it. Having, having a heated and cooled space that is suitable for accommodating larger groups is something that we don't have on the Outer Banks and would certainly add to uh, our ability to host events and, yeah. and did, meetings and did our types of things. Did our and I'm, I'm going to wrap up my questioning here in a minute. No, I apologize, guys. Take your time. The, uh, as I recall, both consultants that were retained by the Tourism Board to evaluate and propose uh, plans for this site both were pretty emphatic that a development site or a conference center without a hotel had a high likelihood of failure. Do I recall that correctly from their reports, or am I wrong on that? Uh, the, the, the word failure wasn't in there. Uh, a okay. standalone multi-use facility is without expected to run out of deficit, an operating deficit. Did they recommend such an option without a hotel? Did either of the studies that we paid for? They, um, they said that, well, the second study, the Johnson Consulting study, said that a standalone facility was still economically feasible and would have tremendous benefit for the community. So they did um, recommend it without the, the hotel. The hotel was uh, said to be complimentary, that it would add to that business and, and make it uh, uh, more economically viable, but they, they, they didn't say that the multi-use facility on its own was destined to fail. Did uh, they take a position to recommend or not a hotel on the site? Both consultants recommended a hotel on the site. Thank you. That's what I recalled, Lee, very clearly, because we debated it at length in our advisory committee. So I return my question. We will use $2.3 million of tourism money to repay Nags Head to maintain, potentially, just the open field and the empty Pamlico Jacks site. And there's another site just north of Pamlico Jacks, or, or was that south of? I'm trying to remember the Dairy Queen site. The Dairy Queen site Dairy Queen. is uh, in between Pamlico Jacks and between. the current event site. Got it. So potentially that could all remain vacant forever, for, or for the foreseeable future, after we've repaid Nags Head. I, um, I'm optimistic that we, this is a part of the process, and we, and we need to take a specific plan of development to the town. I'm not convinced that, that they will not be cooperative. My question back, would you be more cooperative if the $2.3 million was paid after we have an approved plan? I don't, um, I don't, it's not the Tourism Board's perspective that that ownership interest purchase would be as part of a quid pro quo. I, it's, they're, they're, they're two separate things. And certainly if we go down that path, if we, if we purchase the ownership interest from the town and we discover that we aren't able to develop the site as has been recommended by consultant, mm -hmm. consultants, uh, then the tourism board will need to consider its options at that point. As in sell the entire parcel? I don't, uh, that would be for the tourism board's consideration. But that would be an option? Conceivably. Wow, okay. But, but I think that we've shown, um, I think that there is an appetite to develop events out there. And uh, I think that it's also an option that uh, we could develop a facility that meets the current ordinances. It would not be as, um, it wouldn't be as accommodating as what we think we could do out there potentially. Um, but I think it would still expand the use of the site beyond what we have right now. So all of which is to say, um, I think that there are multiple options moving forward. Okay, 
Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Ross. Um, County Manager, from a legal perspective, help me out. Um, with the MOU not having any uh, cutoff date, so to speak, of selling the property back to um, the town of Nags Head, what are the legal ramifications of um, this being, if, if this board chooses not to um, agree to the uh, sale back to the town of Nags Head, um, since, since they've asked for this now, is there any legal ramifications on their um, part against the MOU for not? My understanding is the MOU has no provision in it with regard to sale or resale. It's all a management agreement on how are we going to make decisions to operate whatever we own. Is that correct? As, as long as there's a shared interest. Right. Um, as long as so so what they had is they had the, the two entities own the property, and to make the decision, both entities had to agree. So they did an MOU and said, the tourism board doesn't now have to go to the town to operate the property, but it doesn't do anything that I understand with regard to whether they sell or not sell or whatever. And so <laughs> there's no legal requirement that I'm aware of. There's no promissory note, no anything that would require the tourism board to sell back to the town at any time. And so if you all chose not to approve this, then there would be no legal consequence would be my interpretation. Is that correct, Lee? Yeah. That's my understanding as well. <laughs> but could the uh, town of Nags Head sell their share to an outside individual? No. no. Not, not under the current not MOU. On, right. I just wanted to make that clear. Yeah. And, and also, uh, who initiated this? Was the town of Nags Head say, hey, we, we want you to buy us out? Or did yes. the Tourist Bureau go to the town and say, hey, we want to buy you out? The town of Nags Head initiated that okay. request. Anyone else? What has been the, the tenor of uh, Nags Head with regard to any discussions on uh, potential variances to, to do the optimum um, development there? What, what, what has been the overall tenor that they've, that they've projected? They, um, they have simply said that um, they aren't able to offer, <coughs> offer those variances to an abstraction. They, they, rec they fully recognize that this type of development hasn't existed um, anywhere on the Outer Banks, really, but particularly in Nags Head. And so they fully expect that there are going to be some requests for variances, um, but they can't just start waiving things on parking or, or septic without uh, having a specific plan in front of them. So that's, that's what we're working on now. Right. And, and that's what the advisory committee is, is working on, right? Yes, sir. So, so when that, when that I'll say final plan, for, for lack of a better way of saying it, is presented to them, then they can digest that and decide whether or not they want to allow you to proceed with that development. Yes, with that proposed development. Yes, sir. Right. So, so they will have something hard <coughs> at hand at that point to, to make predicate their decisions upon. Yes. Okay. So, let me, so just before. We've had talk and sort of the implication of a quid pro quo for the purchase versus variance. And I want to just make sure you all understand that's not legal. I mean, you can't buy a variance. And so they have to be separate things. Whatever your timing is, is your timing. But they can't be connected as a legal matter. Thank you for clarifying that, County Manager. Um, Commissioner Bateman, can you share any like on this since you serve on that board? Like I said, I do serve on the board, and I was on the board, I believe, back when we did the purchase, I believe. Um, I served on that board then. It's always been in the back of everyone's mind that at some time the property um, would revert to the Tourist Bureau solely. And that was the thought process. Um, I think Renee was the chairman at the time when um, the deal was struck, that it would be bought back. Um, 
and it's just recently got on the board and this was brought forward and this has been in the making for probably 18 months, two years maybe. I know the, county, the, the attorneys have had it for at least last six months, talking back and forth and so forth. Um, Commissioner Ross brought up some really, really good things. I mean, from a planning standpoint, it would be really, really nice if we, meaning the Tourist Bureau and the town, were right there hand in hand saying, we're going forward and we're going to put this there. I don't think they're there yet. Are they, Rob? No. Are they? Uh, no. Not, not to my knowledge, Commissioner Bateman, yeah. no. Um, that's what I would like to see. I mean, like a hand-in-hand approach to get this thing done and get whatever we're going to, we're going to go there, get built. Um, so I mean, I don't, I don't. I'm just, I'm just kind of rambling on my thoughts here. But um. well, my question back here as a member of the board, uh, I would ask: Is this? When I was working, we used to have a phrase: Is this the highest and best use of 2.3 million dollars of the tourism board available funding? That's a very good question. Because if I were recommending to you to approve this spend, I would be telling you and explaining why this is the highest and best use of $2.3 million of public money held by the Tourism Board and approved and controlled by this Board of Commissioners. So if there are any other options or available uh, avenues for this spending that might be a higher and best use for tourism in the Outer Banks, I would question whether that priority takes precedence over repaying Nags Head for the partial or minority ownership in the site. That's just an open question for you, Lee. Is this the highest and best use of the funds? The, the Tourism Board has determined that it, it wishes to buy out the town of Nags Head's interest. I take that as a yes. You concur that this is the highest and best use as a member of that board, sir? Just because of the fact that since the conception of this, that the board has made a decision that they would at one time buy an set out. Yes, sir. Now, I'm going to throw this out there to you. Um, I've always been, and I thought this when we first originally bought the property, that to have everyone have a skin in the game, maybe bringing this project to, to the completion at some time would might be a better thing if everyone has skin in the game. If set is no longer there, they're no longer a property owner. Are they going to be as aggressive in trying to make these deals work on it? I don't know. You know, that's something to think about. I'd like to say that uh, I I would really like to see a plan, an approved plan, before we throw more money at this. Uh, the land's owned right now. We don't have debt on it. Uh, <clears throat> After there's an approved plan, if the town of Nags Head decides they want out still, then maybe we could do something at that point. But uh, I personally think we that did. we're kind of we racing ahead, and I'd really like to see an approved plan. I'm not comfortable. Sorry, Danny. Excuse me. I'm not. I'm not comfortable moving on this at this time, and. Uh, <clears throat> committing that kind of money to this uh, is too early. Well, there's a, uh, there was a, a request uh, for consent uh, from the Visitors Bureau for the expenditure of totaling 2,336,107 over a period of a 10 years to uh, pay back the Town of Nags Head, so that's the that's the uh, issue before us today. So I would, uh, if there's not any other discussion, uh, the floor is certainly open to as much discussion as we can have about this. If there are, if there's not any additional discussion, then a motion one way or the, or the other needs to be uh, presented to the board. County Manager? You can make a motion to approve, but the lack of a motion, it fails as well. I so. wonder, wonder if we could have a consideration to table until we've had an opportunity 
to dig deeper uh, in, with you, the Vistas Bureau, the town. You can make a motion plan. to table, but a motion to table requires it to come back to the table at a specific date. So you can't say until you understand. need to say at the August meeting or the whatever. I understand meeting. that. Yeah. I understand that. <coughs> so you've heard the uh, options, gentlemen. What, what is the board's pleasure? I'll make a motion to approve. Okay. Then there's a motion on the floor to approve. Is there a second to that motion? Having no second, the motion dies for lack of a second. We're back to the pleasure of the board. I'd make a motion to table it till the August, the first meeting in August. Do you have some stipulations along with that tabling? Uh, the stipulations would be so that gives us ample time to research. You, you can table it to the first meeting in August or the first meeting in September, and then you come back. If you don't have what you need, you can table it again, but you okay. can't. You don't, you right. can, and you can make a request for whatever it is you want to see between now and then. If you don't okay. get it, then you table it again. Thank you, County Manager. So I'm back to you, Commissioner uh, House. Table it till when? In the first meeting in August. Okay, there's a motion on the floor then to table until the first meeting in August. Is there a second to that motion? I'll second it. Commissioner Tobin seconded that motion. Floor is now open for discussion on that motion. Commissioner Couch? I'd like to see a plan. Uh, we've been talking a long time. Yeah. Yeah. Me too. I would agree with Commissioner Couch. Uh, then we, we don't need that as a part of the table in motion, do we, County Manager? Or do we? No, sir, but we. If we're going to wait until August to, to make a decision, then I think we owe it to the tourism Absolutely. to let know what we're looking for. Right. Yeah, to make a decision. Okay. So what we need to do as a board to share those um, share those uh, concerns and um, the information that we need from Mr. Nettles and his board in order to address this uh, August 1st. Well, the question is, does August the 2nd give them time to... To be ready with the plan. Yeah, I, I, that's, not, that's not reasonable time. Yeah. Lee, is that reasonable or not? I think we should have a plan by then. Yeah, we've been working on this advisory committee for a year and a half. Okay, I'm just asking. So if, if if that's the case, we'll you know certainly we have a motion on the floor then, and hopefully we'll have something and and. Um, if I can request a county manager, if the board can share. Uh, those concerns, and, and you relay that to um, to the uh, Vistas Bureau. Hopefully, they'll have that information so that when we come back August one, we can address it again. Is that fair enough to the board? I think so. I'm good. Okay. All right. Then the motion's on the floor. Those in favor of the motion, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, like sign. Motion carries unanimous. Right. Thank you, Lee. That brings us to item ten now. Yes, sir. Um, the second request is uh, is from line item 4503, once again from the restricted fund. And this involves um, some engineering design remodel <coughs> for workspaces within the Roanoke Island Welcome Center. That building was constructed in 2003. Uh, we have uh, the, the request involves um, adding some workspaces. Currently, we have a couple of, uh, we have a, a concentration of uh, workers in one area. In some cases, we have two workers within a particular cube area. Uh, we, we want to try and uh, remodel a little bit to add individual workspaces. We also want to uh, uh, redo the server workspace, which is uh, kind of an unvented room. It's an interior room. Uh, we want to add a, um, uh, a store, take a look at and uh, remodel a storage printer area and add a small meeting area there. The request is for design and engineering. It would also offer services to assist us with getting a bid out for construction. And this firm, uh, if we should move forward, would also work with us through the evaluation of those bids and, and selecting a, um, 
uh, construction company. The amount before you today is $18,500. That's for design and engineering. It does not include the construction cost, of course, which would be a return visit. Move to approve. Second. All right. Second. Motion on the floor by the vice chairman to approve. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Commissioner House. Any further discussion? Hearing none, those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, like so. Motion carries unanimous. Thank, thank you so much, Lee. Yeah, thank you for your Appreciate input. your patience as well. Oh, not at all. Many times. County manager. So that brings us to item 11 on the agenda. This is a resolution approving a permit modifications to the Dare County CND landfill. I believe it was at the workshop. We talked about some of the revenue issues we were having out there. And one of the options we had was to open the landfill uh, up to Terrell and Hyde counties to try to generate additional revenue out there. Um, we looked at it. We tried to determine whether that was going to uh, shorten the life of our landfill significantly and was it worth it and I think the conclusion we would reach is we would try this see what it did see what vibes it generated and, and maybe help us keep the rates down out there for our people as well <coughs> and so this is a resolution that's before you to add Terrell and Hyde as counties that can use our C&D landfill uh, and it needs your approval to move forward so so moved. Uh, was that com you Commissioner Bateman? Yep. Yeah, Commissioner Bateman made the motion. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Vice Chairman. Any further, com any further uh, comments? Hearing none, those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed like sign. Motion carries unanimous. Uh, next, Mr. Chairman, is your consent agenda. On the consent agenda, you have the approval of the minutes for May 17th. You have a resolution authorizing the increase to the federal micro threshold purchasing limit. You have an NCDOT right-of-way three-party encroachment agreement for the Old Wharf's estate project. You have a uh, budget for some sediment testing grants, and you have a social services division request to purchase the Northwoods Traverse software for use in adult family services. Move to approve. Motion on the floor by Commissioner House to approve the consent agenda as presented. Is there a second? Second. Second. Second by the Vice Chairman. Any further, com any further comments? Those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed like sign. Motion carries unanimous. Uh, next are your board appointments. Uh, your first is the Juvenile Crime Prevention Council. The terms of Robert Trevette, Molly McGinnis, Vance Haskett, Gail Hutchinson, Jennifer Carberwitz, Edward Hall, Keith Le Letchworth, Steve House, Laura Twitchell, Sheila Davis, Catherine Irby, and Mark Marcus Hester Smith expire this month. They also wish to be reappointed for a new two-year term. Uh, Pat Hudspeth, Chelsea Arts, Craig Albert, and Nancy Griffin do not wish to be reappointed. And the Juvenile Crime Prevention Council requests that Sarah Sampson, Executive Director in the Children Youth Partnership, be appointed to replace Nancy Griffin as an at-large member. So moved. There's a motion on the floor by uh, Commissioner Couch. Is there a second? Second. Second by Commissioner Tobin. Any further discussion? Uh, just a quick question. Um, does that mean there are three vacancies left if um, if Ms. Sampson is appointed? Two open slots and a student rep, total of three? Correct. And they will remain open. Until you appoint somebody. Correct. My other question, okay, I understand. Should, should we ask JCPC to recommend us? And, and the, with the juvenile defense attorney position, that's an actually defined position, so, and the student rep is, is one also. Should uh, We yeah, can we'll, ask, ask have, them to. Have, yeah. I'll have the clerk go to recommend yes, okay. us recommendations. Right. Great, now I understand. Yeah, Thank the, you. The nomination committee for the JCPC is working on trying to get people lined up. They just, we just couldn't get it done in this gotcha. amount of time. Gotcha. Okay. Gotcha. Thank you. But, but the one thing about JCPC, uh, the next meeting for it will be after the school season starts. So we're going to work, work through that throughout the summer. Okay. And, and just one other thing. It's a very large board, so it is, this yes. limitation is not going to impact it. Under, understood. Thank you. All right, then. There's a motion on the floor to approve. Is there a second? Second. Second. Oh. I'm sorry. I didn't hear. I, I can't. The commissioner <laughs> house. The, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed like sign. Motion carries unanimous. Uh, next is the Man Har Man's Harbor Community Center. The terms of Jennifer Gilbert, Bet Baisley, and Vicki Craddock expire, and they would each like to be reappointed for another two-year term. 
move to reappoint. Motion, motion on the floor by uh, Commissioner House to uh, approve, seconded by Commissioner Bateman. Any further discussion? Hearing none, those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, like sign. Motion carries unanimous. Next is the Rodanthe Way Salvo Community Center. The terms of Susan Gray and J.W. Kurskowski expire in June. Uh, they would both like to be reappointed. So moved. There's a motion on the floor by, was it Commissioner House? Couch. Couch, sorry, Danny. <laughs> Commissioner Couch and is seconded by Commissioner Tobin. Any further discussion? Hearing none, those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, like sign. Motion carries unanimous. Uh, next is the Land Transfer Tax Appeals Board. The terms of Jacqueline Rick Sample and Lynn McLeedon expire in June. They would both like to be reappointed. Uh, June Neri, the former representative for the town of Manny, has moved out of the area, and we're waiting for the town to recommend her replacement. Motion to approve. Motion to approve by Commissioner Tobin. Second. Seconded by Commissioner House. Any further discussion? Well, there's a vacancy. Yep, there's, there's a vacancy open, and you have all the applications. Right. So oh, I'm right at. Uh, is there a recommendation from the app applicants? By the board? Um, and we have. Uh, doesn't appear move so. To, move to approve Rob Rollison for that position. Okay. Uh, uh, Vice Chairman recommended Rob Rollison. I'll, se se I'll second that. And then seconded by Commissioner House. Those in favor of the motion then signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, like sign. Motion carries unanimous. That would be all of your appointments, your upcoming board appointments in July. You have the East Lake Community Center Board with one term, the Game and Wildlife Commission with four terms expiring, the Parks and Rec Advisory Council with nine terms expiring, the Wan Chi's Community Center Board with five terms expiring. In August, the ABC Board has three terms expiring, the Dare County Advisory, the Dare County Center Advisory Board has four terms expiring, the Jury Commission has one term expiring, and the Juvenile Crime Prevention Council has one term expiring. And then in September, you have the Health and Human Services Board with five terms expiring. And with that, Mr. Chairman, that would be your agenda. All right. Thank you, County Manager. That completes our meeting uh, this morning. And I need a motion to adjourn until 5 p.m. on June the 21st. So, so moved. Uh, Commissioner Tobin uh, made the motion, seconded by Commissioner Bateman. Any further discussion? It's raining. Hearing none, those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, like sign. Motion carries unanimous.